helicopter and headed 100 miles north of Kasach Kandal. Our destination, one of the most revered archaeological sites in the world, the ancient kingdom of Angkor. Built over 1,000 years ago and stretching over 1,000 square miles, Angkor was once the center of a vast empire that covered modern-day Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam. It's also the largest pre-industrial city in the world, five times bigger than modern-day New York City. At its peak, Angkor was once home to over a half a million inhabitants. For centuries, this kingdom used an early form of Pradal Saray to wage war against their enemies, the Cham and Siamese. But in 1431, the city was mysteriously abandoned. Today, the only records of Angkor's legacy are 900-year-old carvings on the temple stone walls. Depicting epic Khmer battles, these carvings demonstrate both hand-to-hand -hand combat and deadly weapons techniques. Techniques that Master Crew Boon Tuin and his team of weapons experts were glad to demonstrate. So these weapons are kind of like the weapons that we saw on that wall, like the mural. Exactly. They had been recreated and recovered again on the wall of the temple complex. The real Khmer fighting of the Khmer at that time. So you get a lot of the history of the martial art directly from the carvings that were on the walls. Exactly. You know, oral tradition and carvings on the wall is basically how they redeveloped Boca Tour here in the country. So it's really neat to be here, to be lucky enough to train. The weapons of the Khmer were the Dao, a curved sword, the Dongbong Bang, or long staff, and the Dongbong Wagato, a pair of short sticks. But the best part about these weapons-based moves is that many of them translate well to empty hand moves we can use in our final fight, like this wicked double elbow counter strike. I tell you, one, one elbow is pretty brutal, but coming back and delivering a second one, that... Two for the price of one. Knock the hell out of you. What's this double elbow called? Uh, water buffalo horn fighting. Water buffalo horn fighting. Yeah. I just elbow something. It's like the easy. horn. <laughs> horn. The first step is to close the distance and block an opponent's attack with an outside hand. Then you step in and slash the elbow back and forth across the opponent's face. So we're batting this down here. And then step it into the elbow and then back through with another elbow. The first elbow strike can accelerate to a speed of 25 miles per hour in less than a quarter of a second. Less than a third of a second later, the initial strike is followed by another, equally devastating shot. By employing the bony tip of the elbow, these strikes deliver a double dose of injury producing energy and can result in a broken nose, facial fractures, or a wicked cut. I think a really good way to use this is just sometimes you just get clinched, Bill, and just coming over the top with the knuckle. Because when you're here, a lot of times you get up higher, just pull the arms down, one, and then come back with that second one. I think that's really simple. That's probably the best way to do it, in my opinion. One, two. The double elbow is really brutal. You're not just landing an elbow across the jaw once, but twice. And you know what? It's really good for me, because I like to get in close, I like to swing, and when I'm in close, I like to drop somebody. As we worked on our elbow strikes, crew told us the story of the Khmer's most famous battle. It took place in 1177, when Angkor was invaded by their enemies, the Cham, who hailed from what is now Vietnam. In retaliation, a battalion of Khmer soldiers led by Jayavarman VII used a combination of indigenous weapons and brottle saray to slay the Cham and drive them from the region. Leaving Angkor behind, we headed upriver to Bottom Bong, some 200 miles from Phnom Penh. Though it is definitely off the beaten path, Bottom Bong is home to hundreds of brottle saray fighters. In fact, this region has produced more champions than any other in Cambodia, and nearly all these champs have been trained by this man, legendary master, Crew Hoithok. Hi. Crew Hoithok? Jason. Bill. Big Bill. Over his 50-year career, Hoithok has molded 32 champion fighters. Sweating it out in the blistering heat at his small camp, 
We could tell right away that Hoyt Hawk didn't pamper any of them. I can see why these boxers come all the way to Phnom Penh to become the best, because this kind of training really breeds champions. I mean, you're training in rural conditions, you have poverty keeping you down. It's kind of like Rocky, Cambodia style. What is his key to training a champion Pradal Saray for uh, uh, Saray is uh, included in the use of the knee, elbow, and kicks. And during our warm-up, we noticed that nearly all of Hoyt Hawk's students had mastered his signature move, a brutal flying knee and elbow combination. In Pradal Saray, more knockouts come by way of elbow than any other strike. This is a move we had to learn. Charging at full speed, you explode into the air and drive the spear that is the knee into your opponent's solar plexus. So as, you're, as he's running up, he's driving off of his leg. He's getting in the air. Then, as your opponent buckles forward, you slam your elbow into the crown of their skull. By propelling your body into the air, you effectively become a human missile, hurling your entire body mass into your opponent's gut. The force created by the body's forward momentum is partially absorbed by your opponent, which can knock the wind out of them or even crack a rib. But the coup de gras is the elbow chop, impacting with the head at nearly 15 miles per hour. A solidly landed elbow to the head's frontal bone can knock your opponent out, fracture his skull, or cause serious spinal cord damage. So we're boxing. Damn, that's a lot of weight. How'd that feel? I felt like I had a 300 pound piece of sausage dropped on me. So that's kind of cool, man. Like, I originally saw this and thought, that's cool looking, but how practical is that going to be? It's just like it could be kind of fun to pull off. Let me try it again. That's pretty neat. That's pretty neat. You know, I can't believe this move is legal. I mean, it's an elbow to the top of the head. This may be the only country we're in where this is actually a move you can use. We trained until nightfall. Then crew led us to the outskirts of Badenbaum to show us where deadly moves like these are put into practice. The provincial night fights of Badenbaum are where many rural fighters get their start. Oh! Ranging in age from 14 to 21, they battle it out under the stars in clouds of bugs for a few bucks and a way out of dead-end village life. I don't know what's more dangerous, the guys in the ring or the bugs outside. But these guys aren't fighting for the cash. The winner of this tournament gets to fight in the big leagues in Phnom Penh. Talk about a gritty place, too. You've got a homemade ring, you've got people fighting without any medical supervision, they're beating the crap out of each other. They've got both the nitty and the gritty here. Wanting to see how our new skills measured up, crew set me up with a sparring match against one of the local fighters. You know, when I signed up for this job, I didn't read any of the fine print. Starting to think I need to read more. It was great to test out my skills, and we were both able to land a few shots. But this was as much two guys having fun as it was a full-blown sparring match. Kicks, slams, a lethal combo strike. We now have